<clears throat> Hello everybody and welcome back to another video, another live stream. Um, I've just got a couple of things to set up here. Uh, but yeah, in this video we're going to be going over what you can do to prepare for a job interview in cybersecurity. So I'll just wait for a couple more people to join the live stream so we can all sort of watch and enjoy together. Um, but yeah, won't be too much longer. So just bear with me for a couple of seconds. Um, I just need to share this link on my Discord. And we'll be ready to rock and roll. <clears throat> Alrighty. So... For those of you who are new here, welcome. For those of you returning to another live stream, welcome back. Uh, happy to have you all here. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's good to be back. Uh, we've got Young Something Pro, morning from Scotland. Hello. Uh, it's, uh, what time is it? Almost 9 p.m. at night in uh, Brisbane here. Chinmay Divaka, hey DC, what's up, man? Uh, yeah, we've got some good audio and video. I'm actually streaming from my GoPro for once because my computer lags out way too much and I just hate it. So um, yeah, I've got my uh, my live stream up on the side here so I can read all of your comments as they come in. Now, this video, I wanted to make this because um, basically a few people have been asking me recently for uh, some questions that come up when they're uh, you know going for a job in cybersecurity. And I, I basically wanted to make this video to answer those questions and to help you prepare and get into the right mindset of a job interview in the cybersecurity industry. So I'll cover off the um, the like admin or basic basics first, which are a non-technical questions. So usually when you're going into a job interview, they expect that you already have some prior knowledge. If you've got into the interview stage, then they're probably happy with your credentials and your experience and they just want to sort of push you over the line to see if you're a good culture fit for the company. They'll also include things like some technical questions which we will get to at the end of this video. So when preparing for a job interview, some very basic things. One, dress for the job you want and not the one you're going for. So even if you're going for a entry level sock position, don't turn up in a polo shirt turn up in something really nice, wear a tie, you know, first impressions last, obviously. And being a personable person definitely helps out. So being well-spoken and being able to present yourself nicely to that person means that they're going to be happy with you presenting yourself to other members of the staff if it's an in-house position or their own clients if you are working for an MSP type situation or a private company that will then, you know, rent your services out basically to other people in, um, you know, other organizations that are paying for your service. So <clears throat> a good example of this is the most recent job I went for, which I've, I've only been at for two weeks now. Um, it's a, another cybersecurity contract as an ethical hacker. And this time uh, I wasn't actually the most skilled person to go for the job. The reason I got the job is because they literally said that I'm better presented and a more personable person. The other guy had actually better credentials than me, but being able to present myself and speak to people and, you know, have these sort of conversations where I can just go on and on about a particular subject that I'm really interested in really helped push me over the line in getting this job. And it is something that I recommend to everyone to learn. And, you know, actually a really good way of learning it. And I think where I learned it from is from working in hospitality jobs. I know of all the things, and a, a lot of people say uh, that hospitality is an industry that's gonna make or break you. And I think that's actually quite true. If you go for, if you have had a job in hospitality where you've been dealing with, you know, pushy people all the time, they want their order yesterday, they want everything done, you know, two days ago and they want it perfect. They want that perfect meal. You're gonna learn how to talk to those people and deal with those situations. And that will come across later in your life experience especially when applying for jobs in cybersecurity or IT in as a whole. So, <laughs> so I'm, so I'm reading the comments on the side here and I, I will actually, um, I will get to those. So if you do have any questions, do throw them in there. I will get to them eventually. So, as I was saying, being personable is definitely a good trait to have and being able to present yourself and articulate what you want 
to come across will definitely help you. And I know that might seem obvious, but it's it's actually quite a rare uh, skill to have in the IT industry. A lot of people are quite reserved and held back. And, you know, that's your personality. That's fine. But maybe push yourself to be a little bit more talkative and presentable in that interview. And the first thing I can recommend is to dress nicely and, you know, put some nice deodorant on, spray yourself with some cologne or something. You'll, you'll be, you know, absolutely golden for that first impression, that first impact. Now, the second thing is to study the company that you're applying for a job at. If you go into, say, you're doing an interview with Amazon and you know absolutely nothing about Amazon and they ask you, oh, you know, have you been to the website to check out what the Amazon services are? And you go, no, I haven't actually. I, I know absolutely nothing about Amazon. I know this is a, a very terrible example, but it does happen. So you want to <laughs> do some research on the company that you're applying for just because it's, they're going to ask questions down the line and it'll also help you prepare for the eventually coming technical questions that will come. And once you know a little bit about that company and potentially their clients or what sort of services they run in their business, that will help you to answer those technical questions a little bit further down the line. Now, you don't have to go into like super detail here. You just need to, you know, do a little bit of basic OSINT on that customer or that organization that you're applying for a job at. So, you know, an example I would use is I usually, if I'm applying for a job at an MSP, I'll see if they list any of their clients that they support on their website. I would go through and see what sort of size those clients are and maybe, you know, have a look around their network and or their website rather and you know, just see what sort of services they provide and, you know, what sort of infrastructure they might have on the back end of that. So, yeah, have a look at the company that you're applying for a job at and the customers that they support. Or if it's an in-house organization, just have a look at the size of that organization. You should be able to gauge what sort of technology they're using and what sort of cybersecurity controls they're going to have. Now, I'm going to answer a couple of questions here from the live chat. So if you haven't already asked a question, please do. And I will um, answer those for you right now. So people are saying the streaming quality is good. That's good. I'm trying to improve here. Uh, hello from Melbourne. Hello from Bangladesh. Hello from Philippines. Here we go. A question. Hey, DC. How are you doing? Been a long time. Oxapixel. Yeah. Hey, man. Yeah, I have. I just did a, a video like three days ago. Um, but yeah, I haven't done too many videos as of late because I've been busy with this new contract, uh, learning the ropes and all the rest of it. Um, what jobs can I get after going for an OSCP? The answer is pen tester. You would want to go for a job as a pen tester once you have an OSCP. I need to know the demand of cybersecurity in Australia. Well, as of today, it's funny you say that. Scott Morrison uh, released a statement today that uh, the cybersecurity industry is ever growing and that there is an ever growing, of course, need for cybersecurity consultants in Australia. Um, he did congratulate the people who are currently working in cybersecurity in Australia, which is nice to be recognized for once by the Prime Minister. But um, yeah, he basically said, we're all doing a good job, but it was it, it came off the back of Australia um, having a, a rather large data breach um, in the government organizations um, around Australia. So yeah, pretty serious news that one, but have a look on LinkedIn or, or YouTube or wherever. There's a lot of information about that. Uh, what job can we get with just computer science in cybersecurity? You're likely not to, you will be pushed to the back slightly, but you can get a job as a SOC analyst. Um, that's like a super entry level type answer, I guess, but it's, um, it's not impossible to get a job as a SOC analyst. Um, coming straight from a, a computer science degree. I would recommend though doing some extra courses on the side. For example, a, a Security Plus would be very useful and perhaps even an OSCP would actually be quite handy to get yourself a job after doing that degree. Uh, hey DC, great videos. This is from Dim Gas. One question please. I'm interested in entry level cybersecurity job but they don't need CCNA cert. And from all of your videos, I saw that you suggest to go from CompTIA, Security Plus slash OSCP. Um, I'm not sure what the question is there. I think it's, um, do you need to have a, a Security Plus or OSCP? 
for an entry level job. You don't need it, but it's definitely going to help you out and make you stand out above the rest of the people who are applying for jobs. So definitely worth having a look at um, if that's your thing. Okay, I'll answer one more question. We got one more here from, uh, oh man, I've accidentally clicked away from my video. All right, one more question here. Uh, young Provo, Provo, CCNA or CCMP minimum requirements for network security job roles. CCNA is the minimum requirement for a uh, any sort of network engineering role. Um, most places would prefer a CCMP if you have one, but a CCNA will definitely get you a job as a network engineer. Okay, for everyone who's watching here, please do smash the like button, help me out, get some likes rolling in so that the uh, YouTube algorithm picks this up and uh, throws a bit of joy my way, please. Now, let's get on to the, uh, some, I'm gonna go through 25 cybersecurity job interview questions. Now, the number one question, and this is a very HR based question, which is why are you looking for a new position? Now, if this is your first position, this is obviously a question that you're probably gonna get asked anyway and just say, look, I'm trying to break into the industry I'm very passionate about this industry and you know I've done this project at home and I've I've learned this and I watch all these YouTube videos about cybersecurity I'm just I'm absolutely like balls deep don't say balls deep but I am you know deep into the cybersecurity industry and I absolutely love it I can't wait to get started that's your answer there if you're new uh, if you're coming back to this position maybe say that you're looking for something new and you you know you want a new challenge and uh, to also mention that you're passionate about the industry, that's definitely going to help out as well. Next question, what are your greatness, greatest weaknesses? Now, this is a question that always comes up and basically everyone makes mistakes. So there's always an answer to this question and they want to know what it is. Um, just uh, assess a situation where there was something that you could have done better but didn't actually fail at. So for example, uh, there was a, a network that um, you ended up setting up a network previously as a network engineer with uh, subnets instead of VLANs. And um, that's a, a weakness of yours is that you, you should have had more foresight in that project to, instead of setting up subnets, to have set it up as uh, VLANs. Um, it's a, that's a very basic example, but yeah, something along those sort of lines. All right, some que technical questions now. Uh, what is on your home network? Now, this these are questions that I've actually written down that I have been asked before. And um, so my home network is a full Meraki stack. Now, this is a, the, you can have any home network, right? But make sure you've got some cybersecurity stuff thrown in there. So I usually say, I've got a full Meraki stack at home. I've got a Meraki switch, Meraki firewall, Meraki access point. Um, what I do with that though as well is I created a Pi hole using a Raspberry Pi to, you know, drop all of those bad DNS requests and to essentially make my network more secure. Um, that's It's a very basic answer to that question, but it is something that you get asked fairly often, which is what is on your home network? The next one is what is the difference between a threat, vulnerability and risk? Now, answering this sort of calls for a deeper, I guess, understanding of cybersecurity and anyone working in the field uh, should be able to give a pretty good response. Uh, expect a follow-up question asking uh, which of the three to focus on more than the other. And um, a simple way to put it, and I've written this down, is a threat is from someone targeting a vulnerability or weakness in the organization that was not mitigated or taken care of since it was not properly identified as a risk. Now that sort of covers all of them and it's a nice simple answer to a, a not so simple question. Next one is, how do you go about securing a server? Now, you might wanna break this answer down into different steps, especially if it refers to a specific type of server. So for example, if you're uh, securing a Linux server or a Windows server or maybe a cloud like Azure server or something like that, um, there are different steps to take here to secure a server. Do a little bit of research and this goes back to what technology that company has and uh, yeah, 
you know, tailor it around their business. That's um, that's my you know go to because then they're going to be familiar with the answer you're actually giving. So, for example, if they're like a full Microsoft shop and you say, oh, you know, you can secure a Linux server by doing this and this and this and this, they'll go, okay, he's really strong at Linux, but we don't really manage any Linux machines or or environments, so there's not much point in hiring him. He's really good at Linux, but we don't do Linux, so no point. Understood? Next one. Why is DNS monitoring important? Now, some people argue that this is not really a necessary thing and uh, that saying otherwise indicates that there are weaknesses in the domain name services. Um, Other people say that DNS monitoring is prudent because DNS queries are data exfiltrated vector from networks that allow any host to communicate to their internet on port 53. Now you can dive a little bit more into that by explaining how DNS works and that would probably be a good thing because that question usually does come up anyway. But uh, yeah, that's a a good way to um, explain DNS and uh, the insecurities of different DNS services. Now this question, the next one coming up is one that I've been asked so many times and I absolutely hate this question, but I had to write it in. It is, what port does ping work over? Now, like, okay, we're talking about ICMP requests here, right? So watch out for this question. Ping is a layer three protocol like IP. Ports are an element of the layer four protocols, TCP and UDP. Now you really need to dive in here and answer these questions um, with more detail than what I'm giving you here. I'm just giving you the questions themselves so that you can potentially go out and look for the answers. But um, yeah, have a look at that and um, answer that question as well as you can. Uh, Explaining the different layers is usually a pretty good idea as well. So uh, yeah, I'd do that as well. The next question is, what is the difference between encoding, encrypting, and hashing? Now, if you're going for a job in cryptography, which uh, does exist out there, there's not many of them around these days, but this question does come up fairly often. Um, it's, It's a question that should sort of start a conversation as well. Um, and usually I would tailor it towards encryption and uh, then it will give you the sort of chance to uh, explain encryption and how encryption works by you know hashing algorithms or uh, different types of encoding. So focus it around encryption and then from there we have hashing and encoding and they're sort of on the same sort of layer I guess of the the encryption tree. But um, yeah, try and explain it that way. That's how I would do it. The next question is, what is SSL? Now, as we all know, SSL is a security standard. Uh, It's uh, a technology for creating an encrypted link between a server and a client. And there are different types of SSL as well. So you can have SSL certs, which is probably the most common. And that's usually the one I focus on uh, when answering these questions. Now bear with me one second, I'm running out of steam. I've got some strawberry milk here, I just need to uh, smash like while I'm taking a drink. Oh my god. Alright, next question. <laughs> I'm going to keep powering through these questions and then I'll, I'll answer everyone else's questions in the chat after this. Now, what are the differences between HTTPS, SSL and TLS? Now, HTTPS is a hyperlink transfer protocol and it secures communications over a network. That's sort of where you need to start this conversation, which is that HTTP secures the communication between a network. TLS is a transport layer security protocol and it is uh, essentially the uh, successor to SSL. So uh, yeah, explain it again in more detail than I am, but definitely uh, it's going to be asked in the interview. It usually is in most SOC analyst roles. I used to ask this question to uh, different SOC analyst uh, people when I was interviewing them as part of my last role as a SOC team lead. And um, it's just an annoying question to ask basically and it throws people off. But definitely have a look at that. I will put all of these questions in the description after this video if you want to come back and watch it again though. Next question. What sorts of anomalies would you look for to identify a compromised system? Now, 
there are a thousand ways to skin a cat, just like there are ways to answer this question. Um, but you basically need to show your expertise in um, IPS and like identity theft systems. And uh, yeah, have a look there and basically build like a network arch architecture uh, diagram in your head and then outline that to um, a client. So if you say, for example, uh, firewall, perimeter switch, uh, core switch, this is the flow of a compromised system. It eventually leaks down to a server. So if you can explain how it's transporting through, that's a, a very good way to go about it. Now, I'm just getting some messages on Discord, so I just had to quickly minimize. All right, next question. If you had to both compress and encrypt data during a transmission, which would you do first? So you need to compress first, then encrypt. And since the encryption uh, might take it or, or might make it hard to show compression having much of an effect, that's sort of the way it would flow through. And that's the way I would explain it to someone. Next question. How would you strengthen user authentication? Now, the obvious answer to this is multi-factor authentication. And multi-factor authentication is quite secure. It's pretty good. It's a very common practice and sometimes it's a standard in organizations. Um, you can also enforce a um, more, uh, you know, hectic, I guess, for lack of better word, uh, password policy on the users. But um, I, yeah, usually there's, it, it depends how they're connecting into the network or what they're authenticating against, but multi-factor authentication is the key answer to this question. Uh, okay, how would you defend against cross-site scripting attacks? Now this is a very bug bounty related question because a lot of bug bounty hunters out there uh, do exactly this on different web app services or websites in general to uh, basically penetrate them and get a bug out of it. But um, it's it's pretty much a question that everyone should know, but it is a difficult question to answer. So have a look at different JavaScript vulnerabilities, have a look at how XSS works, and then uh, build up your answer on how to defend against that based on those two technologies. Now, next question. What are the differences between cybersecurity in the cloud and on-premise? Now, this should be fairly obvious, which is that cloud security is usually managed by a cloud company, for example, Azure or AWS or G Suite. They're the major three players in the cloud space um, compared with their on-premise counterparts. Uh, now, G Suite doesn't really have an on-premise one. Azure doesn't either, but Azure slash Microsoft slash Exchange and all of the good Azure stuff that you can do definitely does. You need to explain the difference between, so just use a Microsoft example because that's the most common, but explain how uh, cloud infrastructure works and then how an on-premise infrastructure works. And that's basically the difference between the two that you need to explain. Um, this question I unfortunately got asked in the job interview I'm going, I just went for, and it is, what is RDP? Now, if you don't know what RDP is, you definitely should. Please do mention the port number it uses and um, exactly how it transports through from device connecting to server. You need to explain each step as if it was a, uh, explain it as if you're seeing like an, an ARP table, right? So like a, 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 a route from your machine to the server. Explain it that way. That's the best way to go about answering that annoying but common question. Okay, another question that's always asked that I absolutely hate is what's the difference between UDP and TCP? Now, they're both packets for sending, uh, both, sorry, protocols for sending packets of information across the internet are built on top of the internet protocol. Um, answer it in a way that is basically like, what does TCP stand for? So transmission control protocol and UDP, explain what that is, and then explain exactly how they work. If you don't know, have a look on Google. I'm not answering it in this video, um, but yeah, basically go through it by explaining 
how each of them works individually because then they're going to ask you uh, on top of what the difference is uh, how they how like a packet of UDP works that usually comes off the back of that question. The last question is what is a trace route? Now you've already answered this question hopefully in the um, UDP TCP question as well as the difference between cybersecurity in the cloud and on-premise as well as how RDP works. Um, it's definitely worthwhile answering it in that sort of way, but, but basically explain the different hops of Traceroute from your machine through to, you know, google.com or whatever it is. And explain it that way, that's, you know, that's gonna get you the results you want. All right, now I'm going to go to the questions in the chat here. Um, there's been a lot of them coming through here, so uh, bear with me one second as I get through to these questions. So, uh, okay, Xerox Snipe, welcome back. Uh, friend of the channel, Mr. Snipe. Uh, he says, I got good experience in hacking, but never thought about what's, what jobs as I'm still in school. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not a, an easy um, thing to do, especially coming from school, but my advice to people in school is to finish school and then do some certifications while you're studying. My question was why to take the CCNA cert while they don't ask for it in CyberSec job. I'm interested in my thoughts are to go for Security Plus and OCP. Okay, so yes, yeah, Security Plus and OCP is good. I always recommend the CCNA though because getting into a cybersecurity job straight away is quite difficult. So a common step and a really good way of understanding how everything works is to get a job as a network engineer first and then move to cybersecurity from there. That's why I always recommend the CCNA. It also looks really good on a resume and um, it's, it's yeah, I know it's, it's like $500 or something like that, but it's definitely worthwhile getting that certification. Constantinus Adamedus, I can't read your name, I'm very sorry, says, Hi, have you ever worked yourself outside of your country? Yes, I've worked in Singapore before. Um, <laughs> don't say balls deep, noted. Thank you. <laughs> I've only had one beer as well. Looking handsome today, DC. Thank you, Newman. I love you too. <laughs> Definitely say balls deep. Try to get that into the conversation as many times as possible. The employer will appreciate your high energy attitude. I don't think so, but um, smash like for balls deep. Uh, hi all, suggestions to learn Python for pen testing. There's actually a great course on Udemy called Python for pen testing by Christy Vlad. Um, I don't have a link to it on me, but yeah, just search it in Google and you'll find Christy Vlad's CR. I-S-T-I -I space V-L-A-D. Search him in Google and you'll find his pen testing course on Udemy, no problems. And that it's a very good course. I have actually uh, purchased it and had a look at it myself and it, it's pretty good. Someone's asking here, should I go with CCNA or CompTIA Network Plus? Definitely CCNA, it's far more recognized. Uh, love what you do for the community. Keep going, God bless. Thank you. That's a very nice comment to have. Hey DC, what you say about web attacks, there is not much more explanation in OSCP. I'm not sure what question you're asking there, but um, yeah, maybe ask it a little bit further down the chat and I'll have a look. How to start pen testing, help please. Do an OSCP first and then you will uh, learn all you need to know about doing pen testing and you'll also get a job at the end. Darkom, member chat, what's up? Welcome to the chat, man. Good to have you here. Uh, how to start in cyber forensics. Uh, that's an interesting one. Um, a lot of people who get started in cyber forensics actually come from a managed service provider background or are actually working in a managed service provider. Um, it's a very good way to sort of come across from that sort of mind space into forensics because they the two industries or jobs rather go hand in hand. So yeah, that would be my advice. Uh, CCNA builds on Network Plus. Network Plus is basic networking. CCNA is more to do with Cisco equipment and is much more advanced. Yes, the thing with network equipment and Cisco equipment is that most, uh, I guess, iOSs of different um, network equipment are based on the Cisco iOS anyway. So, uh, or the CLI rather, I should say. So 
it's always worthwhile having a look at the CCNA. It's far more recognized, like I said before, and it, it's, yeah, it's just a, a good set to have. Keenan Highwood. Hey, Daddy. <laughs> What's up, bro? Uh, okay, I have a question. Can you shave the beard so the mo stands out more? Yes, I can. Is anonymous login is normal if it is vulnerabilities how to prevent it? I don't understand your question. Oh, anonymous login is often used for public FTP servers. You can disable anonymous login in the app. Yes. And also, if you're running FTP anywhere, get rid of it and put on secure FTP, please. Um, or use some sort of cloud storage instead because FTP is, is dead. TCP is accurate, UDP is inaccurate and continuous until all data is transmitted. That's a really good answer. I would, I would definitely give you a big tick on the list for that answer. Well done. Uh, what's the theme of this stream? Uh, it's, yeah, I, I already answered that. Would you like to show us your CV in a video and how you present yourself in interviews? Um, well, I've basically just explained how I present myself. Um, my last, the interview I actually went for, I, I didn't even apply for this job and that's not a flex. That's, it's sort of a preemptor to the story. So this headhunter came out and said, I've got this great job for you, mate would you be interested in applying for it? And I, I was at a moment of weakness, right? I was like, oh, okay. So I said, I was like, yep, okay, yeah, let's do it. So I got, uh, first I did a online um, technical examination and I went through that and I got a call back a couple of days later and they said, the recruiter said, you did great on the exam. I was like, good, <laughs> I know what I'm talking about, I'm happy. I said, okay, what we need you to do now is to do a one-on-one uh, -on -one interview with um, one of the owners of the business. I said, oh, okay, cool. So I jumped on, it was during quarantine. So I jumped on a Zoom chat with uh, the business owner and one of the other red team uh, engineers. And uh, they started firing a, a mix of questions on, like technical questions about pen testing and uh, some more just general uh like chat questions, right? Like culture questions. So they started the interview and they said, oh, you know, hey, Dave, welcome. It's good to have a chat with you. Um, you know, it's nice of you to dress up for a Zoom interview. And I, I was just talking shit the whole time. But I said, oh, you know, I'm wearing a nice shirt, but I'm actually nude from the waist down. And they loved it because apparently their culture fits in with that really well. And um it, it was just stupid, like backwards and forwards like this, the whole conversation slash interview with them. And um, I guess they appreciated my uh, just like raw, uh, I don't know, talking ability, right? I wasn't, I wasn't messing about. I answered all of their technical questions. I was able to have a bit of banter with them, a bit of back and forth. And they, they appreciated that. And they obviously saw that I could potentially work with them and their customers uh, to, you know, essentially make them money. So, yeah. Uh, next question from Name McNamee. Nice name, bro. DC, what's your favorite cybersecurity position not in terms of pay on both blue and red team sides? Um, I actually really like risk and compliance. <laughs> and I know that is like the most boring job to have out of the lot, but um, it's uh, it's definitely my favorite one. Um, just because I, I like going to uh, risk and compliance committees and going in there and just owning people, basically. So you go in and you, you answer all of these questions off a checklist and you say, okay, you haven't done any of this. This is the risk and compliance that you need to uh, stay uh, on as a guide and a standard and you need to stick to it. And if you're not, then, you know, we need to re-audit your systems. And it's it's such a powerful position, but it is it is very boring, but I actually really enjoy it. You're so good in explaining concept. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, which is the best platform to learn cybersecurity basics? Probably YouTube, to be honest, mate. Um, can you tell what can I do with Scappy? In my university project, I'm pursuing MSc. I don't know, mate. So I met a guy who says he's in cybersecurity, but the focus is on compliance. 
GDPR, vulnerability management, etc. What's the difference between that and part of CyberSec that deals with pen test? Well, one of those jobs is called risk and compliance, which I was just talking about. And the other one is a penetration tester. Um, it's, uh, yeah, they're, they're two very different sides of cybersecurity, but they, they sort of go hand in hand with each other anyway. So, yeah. I'm getting some messages here from people saying, if people ask about UDP and TCP, direct them to Google. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's so much uh, useful information out there for uh, people who want to learn the, the answers to these questions. I just wanted to give you the introduction to those questions and what's going to be asked. Uh, thoughts on ECPPT certification. It's a good cert. Um, it's just not as recognized as some as the uh, some of the others um, but it is definitely worthwhile having so yeah serious question time how to transfer from forensics to the defensive side uh, you need to have some certifications to do that but having the forensics experience is definitely going to help you out so have a look at a, a security plus as a minimum and um, yeah basically then just start applying for jobs and uh, really focus on um, your experience as leverage when you're going for an interview. Uh, how can I get an internship in cybersecurity? I've done CEH, currently in second year engineering, looking for internship in December in India. There's a few different internships in India that you can go for. Um, have a look at those. Uh, there's a lot of boot camps in India as well that offer an internship off the back of the boot camp. So some of those are really worthwhile. I can't remember the names. I'm very sorry, but uh, yeah, have a look in Google for those. You'll you'll be able to find them pretty quick, I assume. Skysec member, what's up, man? Welcome to the chat. Good to have you here. Uh, did you wear a suit when you were on your Zoom interview? No, I just wore a button-up shirt as a... I don't even know. I think it's a Tommy Hilfiger shirt, button-up blue shirt. Nothing special. What is blue team and red team? Blue team refers to the defensive side of security. Red team refers to the uh, offensive side of security. So hacking and pen testing, all that. Whereas the defensive blue team side is all about defending and securing environments. Uh, yeah, someone also answered that question in the chat. Hey bro, new to the game, so can you run through the top two laptops currently for pen testing at the moment? Uh, well, in my job I'm working at, at the moment, I have a HP Spectre, I think it's called. It's pretty good. I should probably do some live streams through that because it would work much better than my Mac. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty good computer, actually. Um, but I, I don't know, man. You can literally use anything to do a pen test. Uh, Andreas Hoffman, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? What about reverse engineering interviews? Do you have any examples? Um, I don't, but I would recommend if you're looking to learn about reverse engineering, have a look at Radar2. There's a whole bunch of documentation on their website and um, GitHub on different scripts you can run with Radar that are definitely worthwhile having a look at, um, especially if you want to get into the sort of malware analysis side of things. Can you recommend any YouTube channel to learn cyber basics? My channel, The Cyber Mentor, Christy Vlad, uh, Insider PhD, I almost said PHP again, I can't get that out of my head, uh, and Hacksplained and Stock, I guess if you want more bug bounty side of things, and Nahamsek and Tom Nom Nom. <laughs> Have a look at those. Uh, next, Miguel Figueredo, sup? Hey man, welcome back to another live stream. Uh, and this, Alassam, uh, what are the industry recognized SOC analyst certificates? The Security Plus is, the CCNA is also, and um, sometimes, sometimes no OSCP, but very rarely. What do you suggest for web hack? There's not much more in OSCP. Um, you can do the, uh, oh God, I can't remember. There, this is like an OWASP. Uh, web specific one to have a look at so have a look at that how hard is getting a security job in cybersecurity master's degree deacon deacon is my favorite de uh, uh, oh my god university for learning cybersecurity uh, for those of you who don't know it's based in melbourne 
and um, their cybersecurity course is absolutely amazing. It's it's very good. So definitely have a look at uh, Deakin University's courses if you're interested in studying in Australia, specifically in Victoria or Melbourne. It's a it's a great course, mate. Uh, what sort of how hard is it to get a job? Not very. Once you have that degree, uh, you can apply for jobs in Canberra, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, anywhere, and most of them will take you in uh, for at least an entry level role. What are your favorite platforms for monitoring and analysis? <clears throat> it depends what I'm monitoring or analyzing. Uh, do Udemy course certifications on cybersecurity a good alternative to big certifications like OSCP and CCNA? No, not really. They don't uh, hold their value very well. They're essentially worthless in the industry itself. Uh, you left Hackersploit. Oh, I did leave Hackersploit. I'm sorry. I've actually I've got him in my uh, recommended channels thing on my page. I can't believe I forgot him. I think because I said Hacksplained, I forgot about Hacksploit. But anyway, sorry. Uh, CHMCQ or CH Practical? Definitely the practical, but CH is pretty worthless um, at the moment, to be honest. So I, I have a, a CH, and I said that to him when I was getting a job interview, this one. And uh, they they brushed over it. They're like, oh, okay, great. And like they, they honestly just couldn't have cared less about my CEH. So it sort of stabilizes what I say about CEHs. Are Cyberry certifications worth to have for a fresh and cybersecurity job? Worth it? Uh, yeah, maybe, I guess. Um, yeah, they're, they're pretty good. I mean, Cyberry Pro is worth the fee um, if you want to learn about cybersecurity, but going to a job interview saying that you've completed the Cyberry Pro uh, course isn't really worth anything, to be completely honest. And like I'm a Cyberry mentor and saying that is sort of against their rules, I guess, but it's true. It's not really worth anything when you go to a job interview. It's the main certifications that you can get off the back of Cyberry that are worthwhile. Anyway, I am going to uh, answer two more questions and then I'm going to end this live stream. Um, so the second last question is how to start a career in cybersecurity slash ethical ha hacking at beginner level. Go to university if you can. If you can't, do a CompTIA Security Plus a CCNA and a OSCP, and then you will be able to get into a job. Last question. I'm currently trying to find a good study path for first job in cybersecurity. I'm doing Python, Security Plus, CCNA, OSCP. Do you agree with this path? Definitely yes. That is the best pathway to go. It's the one I recommend to absolutely everyone who is trying to break into um the industry and yeah i will answer one more question because i saw a very interesting one come in is tafe cybersec worth it it's worth it as a stepping stone to a degree and if you tie in tafe with a a couple of certifications it's pretty good but tafe on its own is not really worth it in the end so yeah anyway thank you everyone for joining this live stream i hope you have had lots of fun in here i've had lots of fun talking to you all um, I will see you all again very soon. I'm going to make a few more videos over the weekend and, uh, you know, release them out next week at some point. I will continue my basics of cybersecurity course and, um, yeah, it, I'm looking forward to seeing you all back here again. So thank you once again, please do leave a thumbs up for this video and, uh, subscribe if you're new here. And of course I'll see you all on the next one. Have a great day.